OK. Good evening, everyone. Um, Bonsoir tout le monde. Je remercie d'abord remercier euh, le professeur Bouffard pour euh, l'invitation. C'est toujours un plaisir, de, en tant que diplômé de l'Université McGill, de revenir euh, au Bercail. Uh, my talk will be slightly different in that uh, I'll be talking about uh, thermal energy storage in buildings. And I will uh, center my, my talk around uh, three uh, examples uh, that we find in Quebec and in, in Canada. Uh, basically, electric hot water tanks, uh, high temperature compact storage, and I will also talk about a success story, the Drake Landing Solar Community. Let's start perhaps by uh, talking about the uh, energy situation in Quebec. Um, here you have the uh, electric energy consumption by sector, uh, that's the 2011 uh, statistics. Um, on the left, you have the uh, uh, three major sectors, commercial, residential, and industrial. You can see that uh, the residential sector uh, um, has an energy consumption of about uh, 34%. And if you look at this piece of the pie on the right, uh, you'll see that uh, space eating is responsible for 21% and domestic hot water for 4%. So adding these two numbers together, we get the 25%. So 25% of all the energy consumption in Quebec uh, is dedicated to residential space heating and domestic hot water. So that's a lot of energy for these two uh, purposes. Um, now, if we look um, at the uh, relative grid power supply in uh, a cold climate, such as in Quebec, with a high penetration of electric space heating, such as in Quebec, uh, and if we look at what happens over the year, this is January 1st and this is December 31st, we get um, a grid that uh, resembles this uh, curve here. Uh, in, the meter, in, the, in the winter, sorry, we get 100% uh, of grid supply, and in the middle of the summer, this goes down to 60 to 70%. Now, this uh, curve is particular to the province of Quebec. If we go to the next province in Ontario, this curve is totally different, it's uh, much flatter, and in fact, the peak is in the summer. So uh, in Quebec, we have a particular situation where the peak is definitely in, in the winter because of the um, space eating. Now, if we focus on one particular uh, winter day, uh, the peak winter day, we get something uh, similar to this. Here we have um, grid power in the megawatts, um, and we have... Um, this grid power over a 24-hour period, uh, again, in the peak winter day. Um, last year, we hit a, a peak of close to 39,000 uh, uh, megawatts. And at that peak, about uh, 11,000 megawatts was for residential space eating, and another 2,000 megawatts was for domestic hot water eating. So a lot of power uh, for these two purposes. Um, the other thing about this curve is uh, you may have noticed there are two peaks. There's one peak uh, in the morning when people get up, and there's another peak in the evening when people have supper. It's not uh, a duck curve. I guess we can call it a camel curve or whatever. Um, but anyway, this, this is significant. Um, of course, um, the util utility does don't like these peaks, and it um, would be nice to reduce these peaks and use these valleys uh, to uh, um, make these, use these valleys for good use. Um, now, if we summarize all these um, graphs that I've shown so far, um, a quarter of the total annual electric energy consumption is dedicated to space heating and domestic hot water, and about a third of the power demand at peak conditions is for residential space heating and domestic hot water. So that offers, I think, a great potential for power and energy savings using thermal energy storage. And again, I'll show you three examples, starting with electric hot water tanks. Um, a typical Quebec family will consume about uh, one tank full, um, which is about 250 liters per day. This corresponds to about 15 kilowatt hours per day and on an annual basis, about 5,000 kilowatt hours. 
this is a, it's an a tank that I have in my lab. It's uh, represents, uh, it's not a commercial tank, it's a laboratory tank that's transparent for flow visualization studies. Um, but I wanted to show that uh, an electric hot water tank has basically two heating elements, one on the top and one on the bottom. Uh, now, if we uh, look at um, uh, what's the uh, average power uh, demand of uh, uh, an electric hot water heater, um, uh, this curve is shown in blue actually here, uh, and the scale is on the right. So the average power demand of uh, an electric hot water heater is about one kilowatt, okay? And we have 2.5 million hot water tanks in Quebec, so one kilowatts times 2.5 million, that's a lot of kilowatts. And I've superimposed on this uh, the, the red curve that I've shown earlier, uh, the total uh, grid power in, in, uh, in the peak day in, in Quebec. And as you can see, there's a, a correspondence in the peaks of the hot water tanks and the, the grid. Um, and this uh, offers a great possibility if we were to uh, switch off some of the hot water tanks, uh, it would enable us to uh, reduce these, uh, these, uh, the grid, the grid uh, peak. And in fact, um, I did a, a study a number of years ago and uh, I simulated uh, what would happen if we were to uh, shut off uh, the bottom uh, eating element of uh, a quarter of a million hot water tanks in Quebec. And what would happen is that during um, the morning uh, peak, uh, we would have a, a reduced uh, grid power shown on the bottom curve here, and we would displace the load to the valley that we have in the mid-afternoon. So for, from a grid, from a utility perspective, that's, that's a good thing. And for the evening peak, uh, we would be able to reduce this evening peak by about 500 megawatts just by shutting off the bottom eating element of uh, electric hot water tank. So that's, I, I think, uh, one way to uh, alleviate these, these peaks that we have on the grid, uh, just by shutting off the bottom eating element with a timer, uh, very basic stuff. Um, the second example I wanted to show is uh, um, a device that's been developed by uh, some researchers at uh, Hydro-Quebec's research lab in Shawinigan, which I think is a kind of a neat device. Um, it's basically uh, a baseboard eater, and if you look inside, um, you have um, ceramic bricks that are, that are heated with electric heating elements, and these bricks are heated up to about 500 degrees C. So we have high temperature uh, thermal storage. And these uh, bricks are heated uh, overnight uh, when we have a, uh, a valley on the, on the grid uh, power. Um, and when we need some eating during the day, uh, we don't feed these electric eating elements. We just let this energy that's been stored used in the, in the, in the house or in the, uh, in the building. Um, and it works uh, great. Uh, here you have some results in, um, that were uh, measured data at a building, a commercial building in Quebec City, the, the E.H. Price building. Um, in this building, what they did, they installed about 60 of these uh, radiators. And um, here, you see, here we see the power curve uh, over a 24-hour uh, period. And you can see that overnight from midnight to about 8 in the morning, uh, these units would be on and they would draw about 100 kilowatts. And they would be, uh, most of them would be shut off in, in the morning and they would uh, not require much power during the daytime when the, the grid uh, has uh, these two peaks that I mentioned earlier. And in the evening uh, at around uh, 10 o'clock, then these um, units would be re-energized um, for the next day. On the top curve, you see the temperature inside these radiators. You can see that when we're charging them in, in the middle of the night, we are reaching about 500 degrees C, and as we discharge them, the temperature decreases to about 300 degrees C. We still have some energy uh, at the end of this particular day. Uh, 
The third example I wanted to uh, show is um, has to do with uh, seasonable, seasonal, sorry, seasonal thermal energy storage. The first two examples were uh, daily uh, thermal energy storage. This is a, 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 a curve that we often see. Um, uh, this is a full year. Uh, the red curve sh shows solar availability. availability. We have more solar in the summer, as we all know. Um, and the blue curve uh, is the space eating needs uh, in uh, a northern uh, climate like, such as our, our climate. So um, you can see that, uh, as I mentioned in the bottom here, the space eating needs and solar availability are not in sync. Uh, it would be nice if we could store uh, the solar energy that we uh, have uh, in the summer and use it in the winter, do what we call seasonable uh, seasonal thermal energy storage. Uh, and the best example of this is actually in Canada. It's called the Drake Landing Solar Community. Uh, it's uh, located near Calgary. And what you see on this picture taken in the winter, the, the, you see that it's been snowing. And the, the dark uh, alleys are actually thermal solar collectors on garages, on the garage of each house. Um, and uh, we're collecting. Uh, solar heat in this particular case in the winter, but we're also collecting solar heat in the summer. And we're actually using a system uh, that's depicted here. Uh, this is a very uh, basic schematic. It's a, a bit more complicated than that, but for this talk, I think it's adequate. What we're doing basically, we have a, um, we're a solar collector. We're collecting um, solar energy in the summer, and we're storing it in the ground, actually. Um, in what we call a, a boreal thermal energy storage. So we, we basically eat the ground to about 60, 70 degrees C. I'll show you some curves uh, in a minute. And we use this stored energy to heat uh, the houses in the winter. So we uh, have a circuit where we feed the houses with uh, hot water coming from the ground. And when we don't have enough uh, heat from the ground, we just use auxiliary uh, eating. Uh, this uh, has been working fine for the last five years. Here we have uh, measured temperature in the boreal storage uh, over, again, a five-year period. So uh, we've reached sort of a steady state. Uh, and uh, as you can see, as indicated here, uh, in the beginning of the summer, we uh, charged the, the, the ground. Uh, sorry. We charged the, the, the ground. So back. Ah. There we go. Sorry about that. So we charge the, um, the ground uh, up to about uh, 60 degrees C. And um, when the winter starts, uh, we pump this uh, hot water, or uh, in this particular case, it's hot water, uh, to um, uh, fill the space eating needs of the, the various houses. And we do this uh, every year, and we, we can see the five cycles here, and it's been working fine. And the, uh, the results, and this is my last uh, slide, um, this is, shows the, the, the blue curve that I've shown earlier, the space eating needs. Um, and with this facility, we were able to uh, um, fill the, these needs with 95% solar. Uh, we only need about 5% of auxiliary heat. So we have what we call a solar fraction of 95% for space heating. So 95% of the space heating is, comes from renewable energy. So it's quite, a, quite, a, a, quite an accomplishment, and it's been a, working fine for the last uh, five years. And I guess most of you haven't heard about this. So uh, to summarize my, my talk, uh, I think I've shown that buildings use a substanti substantial amount of energy. Um, buildings in Quebec require a significant amount of power at peak conditions. And there are solutions uh, to reduce the energy and power impacts of building. And I've shown uh, three example, uh, electric hot water tanks, compact high temperature storage, and uh, the last one, seasonable storage in boroughs. On that, I'll be Happy to answer any questions during the Q&A uh, session. Thank you.